and thank you all, a bunch of you this morning, as a matter of fact. That begs a question, doesn't it? Being caught up in his presence. When, uh, first of all, have you ever? Have you ever been caught up in the presence of God in a, in a way where you just didn't want to leave? I mean, that visual imagery of that just reminds me of, of, of what should be every morning, our time with the Lord, every evening, our time in prayer. I mean, just think about being enraptured in the love and the, and the presence of our Savior. Have you ever been? And then secondly, when was the last time you were? Enraptured, just caught up in His presence. I mean, I remember dating my bride, my beautiful wife. You guys remember that when you were young? Those of you that are married? And you didn't have to do anything. You could just stare at each other. You didn't have to have an agenda. didn't have to go out to eat. didn't have to have a movie. didn't have to go bowling. you just be, be enjoying each other's presence. This should be our relationship with our Savior to a much larger degree. Just be in His presence. Just to, just to enjoy knowing that He's there. We don't need sunshine for that. You don't need sunny, 70-degree weather for that. That should be an everyday experience of the true believer, those who have been bought with a price. Is that you this morning? Well, we're going to start something this morning that's, that's going to be an endeavor. This is, going to, this is going to take a while. We're going to start the book of Acts. This is the introduction to the book of Acts. And the Acts is 28 chapters long. So some of you may not live through it. Thank you for laughing at that. That was a joke. I might not live through it. Uh, 28 years. 28 chapters could take 28 years you never know martin lloyd jones probably my favorite pastor of ever spent seven years through the book of ephesians seven years through the book of ephesians so i hope that you're excited about that i would tell you that as we start this endeavor through the book of acts i'm intimidated by this this is not a book that's unknown it's not something that that you can just kind of pull out of and people like oh that's in there no we know the book of acts but i want us to rehear it i want us to to go deeper into it and then to apply it to our lives because the book of Acts is, is, is a unique book all in of its own. We're going to try to introduce it this morning. This is basically what we're going to be doing, to introduce the book of Acts. I want it, I want it to, to tantalize you, to draw you in, to make you hungry and thirsty after what the Lord is wanting and desiring to do through you in this community, in your church, in your family. Not, not to hear it in an intellectual ascent and to be able to answer questions, you know, that I'm not going to give you. I am going to give you questions, but not in a test form. Although that might be fun. Maybe we should have a test. At the end of every service, fill in the blank. I want it to, I want it to cause you to fall in love. That song David just sang. To fall in love with the Lord. Let's begin. If you're, if you're, if you, since you have your Bibles, please do open it up to Acts chapter 1. We're going we're gonna to be in the first five verses, but we're really not going to get started very much in them. We're going to come back to the next Sunday and then... Lord willing, the following Sundays after that. But we're going to be there for a little bit, and we're going to read it. But this is the book of Acts. It's a history book. We're going to be talking deep about the history of the, of the early church, the history of our ancestry and, and what we believe in our doctrine and our theology and how it went into action. It's a wonderful and blessed history of Jesus. This is the key of Jesus working through the blood-bought believers of the early church. How does that relate to us? It's Jesus working through us into effecting a change in our community. It's missions. It's the Great Commission. That is this book, the book of Acts of the Apostles. If you would, since you're there, read with me. Follow along as I read Acts chapter 1, 1 through 5. It starts off like this. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had been given commandment, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings of many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said. You had, have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Let's, let's go to the Word, let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray that He opens this Word to us in this introduction to the book of Acts. Would you pray with me? Father, as we begin, um, begin a very daunting task, something that, uh, that is, is intimidating, 
Father, to us. Uh, to see these great men and women of God from almost 2,000 years ago, to see their life and how you worked in them and the, and the mighty things that you accomplished through them. Father, that can cause us to sometimes wonder um, what's wrong now, why, it's, why it seems so cold and so dark and so loveless. Father, I pray that as we study this, as we go through this book, that you will open up to us uh, a new and a bright and a, and a, and a, and a, ver- a fi- vibrant relationship with you, Lord, that would be sustained through your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would be able to, um, to hunger and to thirst after your righteousness. Father, that we would set aside our own desires and the, the loves of this world and that we would fall in love with you, our first love. Lord, teach us today, teach us every day when we dig into this book, this wonderful, inerrant, perfect word of God that you have given us to know you. Father, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us this morning. Lord, we ask these things for your glory and for your name's sake, and in your Son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So there's a warning at the very beginning. There's a warning to, to, to how you study the Bible. And I think this needs to be heard, so I might say it twice, but I want you to, to hear this closely. Oftentimes, and there's even a Bible study group out there that does this, they ask a question. It's called the Discovery Bible Study. They ask a question after they've read the verses. They say, what does that verse mean to you? I don't want you to ask that question. I don't care what that verse means to you. I, I care what the author of that verse meant it to say to you. And what it commands you to do. So we don't ask the question at the very beginning. There's a warning. Don't ask the question, what does this verse mean to me? Because it, it, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> what is God doing through that verse to change you to be more like him? Okay, so, so here's the warning. Uh, ask God to teach you, what does this verse mean? What is this verse supposed to, to tell me, to teach me? And how does it change me? So, just kind of set that apart. There's a little background necessary to fully understand uh, the context of this book. So we're going we're gonna to start off in this introduction kind of to think about this because how you view something really changes how you think of something. Here's an illustration. Maybe not a very good one, but an illustration. Uh, it's rainy outside. It's, it's dreary. One hand, you have a farmer, right? Think back to August, Scott. You have some farmers that are standing here, and they're, they're praying for rain. I remember literally praying, God, send us rain. You have a farmer standing here. The clouds are coming in. He is praising God. Thank you, Lord, for this rain. My crops are going to grow. My, my cattle are going to be fed. But then on the other hand, you have a man standing here saying, No, please, don't let it rain. We don't need rain. Why? Well, because he just started a roofing project and has the entire roof tore off of his house. If it rains, it's going to destroy everything inside of it. It's going to be a big problem. You see how perspective kind of changes the way we view things. When you read this book of Acts, when you read anything in Scripture, you need to kind of set aside your perspective, your worldview, your cultural lens, your likes, your dislikes, how you view certain things. Uh, when you read the Scripture, just, just come into it afresh. Come into it not, not, not with your brain on neutral, but come into it afresh saying, Lord, what is does this verse mean? What did it mean in the day you wrote it, who you wrote it to, for the reason you wrote it, and how is that to affect me? How is that to change my life? So there's perspective. Perspective changes everything. Um, Perception is very subjective. Do you agree with that? That perspective is subjective, how you look at things. Some people like it cloudy and dreary, foggy. I am one of those people. I apologize for saying that out loud to you that are cursing the dreariness. I like the fogginess. I like the, the calm of it. I like the winter. I like it when it's 20 below zero. Why can't you? I don't mind cold, but I'm different maybe than some. Some of you might agree with me, but uh, perspective changes things. How we view things literally is, 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 is according to how we have past experiences. Our level of awareness our likes and dislikes, our beliefs even play into this. So if you go into reading Scripture with your already preconceived notions, then you're going to come out the other end with maybe a little different view than God meant it. So we need to know some things about the Scripture. We need to know a few things. Here's what you need to know. You need to know the authorship. Who wrote it? We're going to talk about that. Who wrote the book of Acts? We need to, write, we need to know the location. Where was it written? Who was it written to? The date that it was written. Why? 
was it written? All of these things are very important questions when you go to study your scripture, actually in anything, in history, in science, in biology, in math. Knowing these things will actually give you, give you something to hang them on, give you a little bit of perspective to know it. So, who is the author of the book of Acts? There's very little that disagree with this. It's, it's Luke. Luke. Did you know that? Luke was the author of the book of Acts. He's also the author of the Gospel of Luke. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he wrote the book of Acts. Most everyone agrees with that. He's not a very notable person in the Bible. You will only find him mentioned three times in Scripture. Did you know that? I'm going to give you some information. I, I, I didn't know all of this, and I assume you didn't know it. So if I'm making you sound like you're less intelligent than you are, I apologize. Maybe you have all this figured out. But I'm going to say it again anyways. He was not an apostle. Luke was not an apostle. He was not a disciple. He was not well known. What he was was a fellow laborer to Paul. He was said that. Paul said, he's my fellow laborer. He comes alongside of me. He was called the beloved physician in Colossians. Luke was a doctor, or it said that he was a doctor in, the old, in this New Testament time. He was also a Gentile. He was the only Gentile to pen anything in Scripture that we know of for sure. All the rest were Hebrews, were Jews. Luke was a Gentile, the only one to write any part of the New Testament. Some trivia. Some of you like trivia. Yeah, here's some uh, questions to test here. It's like Jeopardy. I don't have any music to go with it. Here's some trivia. Who wrote uh, the majority of the New Testament? Oh, somebody just said Luke. Cheater. Who was that? Luke wrote the most chapters, the most verses, the most words. Most people say Paul because he wrote 13, maybe 14, if you give him Hebrews, books of the New Testament. Paul, very influential. John wrote five books of the New Testament, also very influential. I have the numbers here. Paul wrote 24% of the New Testament. Paul wrote 24%, that's a lot, of the New Testament. John wrote 20% of the New Testament. Luke wrote 27.5. Whoever said that, Scott, Brett, uh, there you go, Brett. You get the gold star, buddy. You're on the list. 27.5% because of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. It's a large book. There's so much history poured into this thing. That's just a little bit of information that you didn't need to know, but hey, now you do. So next time that question, you can be with Brett over here. Does it surprise you to know that a Gentile, out of nowhere, this, this just basic Gentile, only mentioned three times in the Bible, this guy named Luke, a physician, that he wrote the majority of the New Testament? That surprised me. I was very excited to hear that. It gives me hope as somebody that's not well known, that doesn't have much going for him, that God can use me to do great things. It should cause you to be hopeful. It's not like Paul, you know, the Apostle Paul. He was somebody. He was raised at the feet of Gamaliel. You know, he just was a Jew from the very beginning. He just had everything going for him until he started persecuting and killing the church. And then he was saved through that. Did you know that story's in the book of Acts? That's where we find it, in the book of Acts. Luke has only mentioned these three times. He's unknown. Very little is known about him until he accepts Christ as his Savior. He joins Paul on many of his missionary journeys, and he's a huge help to him as we find out through all of, well, through some of Luke and all the epistles. He was a close friend to Paul. As a matter of fact, he was the only one with him when we believe that Paul was executed, when he was, when he was martyred, when he was killed. Luke was the only one there. We read that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. I'll read it for you. He says, Paul says, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, there's a, there's a huge sermon built into those, that one verse right there, that one portion of the verse. Let me say it again. For Demas has forsaken me. A man named Demas has forsaken him, having loved this present world. It goes on to says. And it goes on to say he's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia, meaning another man went to Galatia, and Titus to, to Dalmedia. Only Luke is with me. That's what he finishes that out with in 2 Timothy. Only Luke, my beloved friend, this physician, is with me. He's caring for him. He's here, he's here with me. Did you know where he is, by the way? He's in Rome. Do you know why Paul's there? He's in prison. Do you know what happens? He dies. So he's not just on vacation with Paul in the Bahamas somewhere, sipping on a, on a, on a whatever that thing's called, on a lemonade. He's in Rome. Persecution, potential death, with him, helping out this friend. 
Luke has something about him. He is a missionary. He is a historian. He's a physician. He's an evangelist. He's a pastor. He's a friend. He's a brother. He's a theologian. This Luke, this little name, nobody, Gentile Luke, is something special. He's the -the behind-the-scenes man, a humble, hard worker. He's trustworthy. He's faithful. He'll do what he says he's going to do. He's not like Demas. He's there. So where does this book, Acts, come from? What's the location? Where was the location that it was maybe written? It's not clearly given. We don't know exactly where it was. Some believe that that Luke probably penned it while in prison or at the prison with uh, Paul in Rome. That's not really important. The idea is that he has gathered all this information. He's, He's brought it together into this one book that we have in a very succinct and very, very eloquent and and visually appealing way. It has details that no other gospel has, that no other book has. He's a great writer. He joined Luke on all these missionary journeys. He spent time with Peter. He spent time with Mark. He was in Asia Minor. He was in Italy. He was in Greece. He was in Syria, Sicily, Germany. Uh, Not Germany. Germany didn't exist then. Jerusalem and in Rome. He spent time in these places, so, so Luke had this information that he could now pin and when you read it, you, you find some of Luke's personality in there, as you do all the books of the Bible. You see a little bit of the man in there, but a whole lot of God. And so you find that in there. Luke was not personally there for Jesus' ascension that we know of. He wasn't there. Remember, he was not an apostle. He was not a disciple. He was not there for the, for the upper room, 10 days of prayer. We're going to read that. Where Jesus says, go back to Jerusalem and spend time in prayer. Wait for the for the power of the Holy Ghost to be put on you. He wasn't, Luke was not there according to what we know. He wasn't there when Matthias was chosen to take the place of Judas. He wasn't there at the day of Pentecost, most likely. Missed it. He's missing out on some things. He wasn't there when, when Peter preaches this sermon and 3,000 people are saved and join the church. How would that be this morning if 3,000 people filled out the, our, little, our little slip and joined this church? We might have to jump into a building project. 3,000 people. Luke missed that. He he wasn't there when Peter and John were arrested and thrown in prison, when the walls were shaken. He wasn't there when, when Stephen was martyred and killed, most likely. He missed a lot of this stuff, but yet he still was able to write all this down through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the firsthand knowledge that he gained from Paul, from Peter, and from Mark. We don't even see uh, Luke listed until about the 15th chapter of, of the book that he wrote, of Acts. He doesn't say his name. He doesn't say, yes, I'm Luke. I want to be known. I'm a Gentile. I did all this. He's very humble. He's very quiet in what he does and how he does it. We never hear his testimony of coming to Christ. It's not in there, as we do Paul. We don't see if how Christ worked in that point in his life, but we certainly see how he worked in it after salvation. We see how he worked through him to write this book that we have. Historians believe that that Luke was probably hung or crucified in an olive tree in Greece. Historically, that's what we have. It's not in Scripture. We don't know of his death. Historically, he was crucified in an olive tree. Peter, Mark, and Paul, no doubt, gave him a lot of these first-hand accounts of the things that he missed out on. And he took it and he wrote it down, and it was skillfully written down. He had, a, he had a, a grasp on the Greek language that, uh, that maybe the others didn't fully have. He's a doctor, probably fairly intelligent, a good writer, and it comes out in his writing. When you read it, it's kind of a three-dimensional picture of what took place. When you read about, about the day of Pentecost, when you can hear the sounds and you can see the flame of fire above their head, that's Luke writing in through the power of the Holy Spirit what happened during that time. The date, when was it written? This is also important. This is all important to our understanding of Scripture. It was probably written around A.D. 60 or 62. That would only be about 30 years after Christ's crucifixion. It's not long. Some of you young people, youth, are like, oh, that's a long time. That's an old dude right there. 30 years in antiquity is but a blink of the eye. I mean, there's nothing in history that gets lost in 30 years. That's a short time. So it's probably around that 60 to 62 A.D. Why do we believe that? Scholars believe that because there's nothing mentioned of Paul's death which took place in 64 A.D. There's nothing mentioned about the fall of Jerusalem, about the destruction of the, of the temple. There's nothing in there about this. And so they believe it was probably penned before that happened in A.D. 70. 
Also note that there would have been eyewitnesses still there, many of them that saw all of these things happen. And if Luke got it wrong, what would a good Baptist have done? Yeah, that's right. No, 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 you missed this point. That's not the way it happened. So believe me when I say we can trust this because of when he wrote it, the earliness of his writing, and mainly because of who wrote it, the Holy Spirit through Luke. The Holy Spirit through Luke penned this, and so we can trust it. We can know that it's right. The book of Acts is the second letter in this series. The book of Luke ends, Acts picks right, right up where he left off. It's a pretty amazing thing as we read it, and we're going to. Who was it originally written to? Well, a man named Theophilus. What do you know of Theophilus in Scripture? Absolutely nothing. It's a name put in there two different times, in Luke and in Acts, and we don't hear of him again. We don't know much about this man. It was written to him specifically to him, but written more largely to everyone who would read it and us included. It was written with us in mind. Theophilus uh, is probably from Antioch, perhaps, and his name means lover of God. Luke, let's see, let's see how it picks up and how he mentions him and how it ends in Luke and begins in Acts. So Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it starts off this way. This is how we hear about this man. In as much, in as, much as many have taken in hand to set an ordered narrative of these things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who have been from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers to the word delivered to us, it seemed good to me also, having been perfected, understanding all the things from the very first, to write an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you have been instructed. This is Luke speaking at the very beginning of his book. He's saying, I'm writing it to you that, that I want you to hear these things that are perfect, these things that have been done. I want to disciple you almost i want you to know that these things are right and they're done perfectly to know the certainty of these things that you've been instructed of and then you you go from that you know you see that he calls him most excellent some people believe that theophilus probably was a a roman leader or a or a politician or somebody with some importance to him because they called him most excellent it's a typical greeting for an official but now you look down in the book of acts and it, it changes a little bit it becomes more personal Luke was probably had been witnessing to him or knew that he had heard some of this, and so he's giving him more information. He's going to call him just O Theophilus in the book of Acts as it starts off. Instead of, instead of most excellent, he just says O Theophilus. It's a friending. It's, a, it's an endearing term. If it weren't for the book of Acts, like if, if we were to, to pull out the book of Acts out of the New Testament, we would have this huge gap, obviously, of, of many words, but of all the doctrine and theology put into practice. We'd have this huge gap between the gospel and the epistles. Luke bridges this perfect gap. Alistair Begg says this. Alistair Begg says, In the Old Testament, we have Jesus predicted. Old Testament, prophecy. It predicts Jesus' is coming. In the gospel, we have him revealed. He's revealed. He takes on flesh, right? John chapter 1, verse 1. Takes on flesh. Becomes a man. In the Acts and the Apostles, we have him preached so we had him predicted we had him revealed in the acts we have him preached in the epistles we have him explained paul goes into much detail to explain what it means and then in the book of revelations we have him expected so these are the the view or the or the direction that the scripture takes us rc rc sproul says that it's that the book of acts is like a floodlight i love that illustration it's like a a floodlight to show the direction between the gospels and the epistles it points you in the right direction. If you didn't know that they put these things into practice, you wouldn't know what they mean when you get to the epistles. The main purpose of this book, here's the main purpose, the thesis, the, the reason why we would read it, it's to preach Jesus Christ. It's to preach Jesus Christ, to see how they did it, to hear how they did it, to watch how they did it, and then to emulate it in our own lives. Jesus Christ preached. Experience it, see it, and hear it. To see how these early churches went out and they they talked about it. They didn't, just, they didn't just live it. They didn't have bumper stickers and T-shirts and said, that's good enough. If somebody wants to know Jesus, they'll come to me because obviously they know I'm a disciple. I'm an apostle. They preached the word of God. They used their words. It was out loud. The book of Acts tells this in great detail. You see it over and over. It's preached. Romans chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. 
out loud. Listen to this. Romans chapter 10, verses 17 and 18 said, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say to you, but I say, have they not heard? Question mark. Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. It's talking about the book of Acts. This is the sound. It has been preached. It is going out. It must continue in us, in this, in this church, in Main Street Baptist Church. The word must be preached because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It says in Matthew chapter 11, it says, He that has ears, let him hear. He that has ears, not just physical ears, but spiritual ears to hear. I think sometimes we, we hear words, but we don't allow them to, to change us on the inside. We don't allow them to take the, the place that they should in our hearts and our lives and make a difference in us. The secondary purpose of this book, we're just about through the introduction of how this works. The secondary purpose of Luke writing this is for history. It's so that we can see and know the history of our of these men and women of God and how they worked and how they changed. However, the main emphasis, even in the history, is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. The Great Commission says, go and preach and teach and baptize and make disciples of all nations. The book of Acts is the fulfillment of that. It's them actually doing it. Acts shows these Christians in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. It shows them doing the work. It doesn't just tell them to do it and step back. It watches them do it. The book of Acts highlights the wonderful gifts of the Holy Spirit as he empowers us and gives us this ability to guide, to teach, and to convict other people. As we see, there's many miracles, as, you, as we will see when we get into this book. You're going to see lots of miracles, lots of signs and wonders. Some of us are going to stop and ask, well, why don't we see these now? What happened? We're going to get to that. What happened? Why is it not like it used to be? All these things were done to prove the message of the apostles. The book of Acts begins at the ascension of Christ. The gospel stops with the crucifixion and the ascension. The book of Acts picks up right there when Christ is taken up into heaven. It begins with the Holy Spirit being given to us, and it ends with the, apost the apostolic giving of the New Testament in the way the Scripture was given to us in all of the books of the Bible that we have. And that was given while, while men of old spoke, while the Holy Spirit spoke to men of old and they wrote it down. There's two main parts to the book of Acts that we're going to get into. The first part, one, chapters 1 through 12, is Peter. It's the, it's the story of how Peter was the beginning of the church. The second half is going to be Paul. 13 through 28 is going to be Paul and his workings all the way almost to his martyrdom. And all through this, there's going to be a many, many main points. Let me just list a few of them. A few of these things that we're going to get to that you need to know are in the book of Acts and the reason why it's so deep. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in, Jer in Jerusalem, all of Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's in the book of Acts. That's where we get that from. That's where we get that mandate of where to go and when to go. Acts 4.12 says that there is salvation found in no one else, only through Jesus Christ. That's where we find out that Mormons do not serve the same Jesus we do. It's where we find out that Islam is a, is, is a belief, is a cult that's sending people to hell. It's where we find out that Taoism and Buddhism and, and all the other cults in the world do not fit into this. Universalism does not exist. How do we know that? The book of Acts. It's very clearly right here. It says salvation is found in no one else, only in Jesus Christ. It's clear to us. Acts 4 verses 19 through 20 says, But Peter and John replied, this is when they're told to be quiet and told to quit talking or, or to not speak up about Jesus. And they replied, Judge for yourself whether it is right for God in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help but to speak about what we have heard. It's where we learn this. That even if the government comes to us and says, hey, uh, Main Street Baptist Church, we've got COVID number 5, 12, whatever it is, you've got to shut your doors. You're not essential. That's where we find out, no, no, no. We can say whether it is right in your eyes for us to listen to you or listen to God, I must obey Christ. I must obey my Lord and Savior. I must speak of what is true. Then we also find Paul's dramatic conversion here. Luke writes it out very clearly about how he was saved on the way to Damascus. 
We get his testimony from that, how he was changed in a way that we, we wish we could see more of and those that we witness to. Baptist, you're going to love this. In Acts chapter 10, we're going to get to and we're going to read that, that Peter receives a vision of this sheet being laid down in front of him and all these clean animals that you can now eat. You know what your diet would look like if we didn't have Acts chapter 10? Halal. <laughs> there would be no pork. There would be no, no good uh, shrimp and, and the other, other, other things that we just like to have in our uh, potlucks back here. Your food would be a little different. Acts chapter 16, 31 says, um, says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's where we hang everything. All, the book of Acts is so important to us and to our beliefs. That's why we're going to spend a lot of time going through it, detailed, verse by verse. And I, and I pray that you desire this. And if you don't, I pray that the Lord will change your heart to desire to, to be in this and to be involved in this. So let me just give you a few points of how this begins so that we can pick it up and run next Sunday as we start. This book of Acts picks up where Matthew left off. Book of Matthew, book of Mark, book of Luke, book of John. They end with the commission. They stop right there and then then the book of Acts takes right off. So this is what it says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 20. Something that a missionary loves deeply, this verse. It gives us hope in the dark times. It should give us hope here in this mission field to know that we we have a commandment, we have a commission. This is Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, listen to what he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Mark says very similar very, very similar statement there. Luke says almost the exact same thing. He talks about uh, that repentance and remission must be preached to all the nations before the end would come. So the book of Luke just blends perfectly into this book of Acts that we see, and we find out that it's the conclusion of everything that's happening in order to prepare the church to do what it must be doing. First John chapter 21, verse 25, the very end of it, The very end of John sets up the book of Acts perfectly. Remember, it's the bridge to get us to the epistles. It's the the floodlight to show us what we must be learning. John chapter 21, verse 25 says this, And there are also many other things that Jesus did that were... uh, Let me start over again. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written about him. There was so much written about, so much done that's going to happen in the book of Acts and that has happened since then, we can't possibly know it all. But the book of Acts gives us every detail, every jot and every tittle of what you should know of Christ and should know of how to serve him. This book of Acts begins exactly where Luke left off. Luke ends with this. Let's read it. Luke chapter 24, 48 through 53 says this. And you are witnesses of the things. Behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in Jerusalem until you are endured with power from on high. And he will lead them, and he led them out of Bethany, and they lifted up the hands blessed and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they continued in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. This is how Luke ended his, ended his gospel, perfectly, because that was the ascension of Christ. And then he picks it up with what we read this, just at the beginning of this. Let's read it again. This is Acts chapter 1, 1 through 5. We Just pause that in your mind, what you read in Luke, and now let's pick it up in Acts chapter 1 through, 1 through 5. The former account, so he's speaking of the former account that he just had finished in Luke to Theophilus. That former account that I made you, O Theophilus, of all that, Ju- all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Ghost had been commanded had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs being seen by them during those 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them he commanded them not to depart for Jerusalem 
but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from thence. So this book of Acts shows God essentially um, using a group of very ordinary men. Nothing special about them. Fishermen, commoners, just, just normal everyday people. Using them to do an amazing thing, to go and to preach the gospel of repentance throughout all the world. And that's exactly what they did. That's what the book of Acts is going to show us. They were teaching, they were fellowship, they were breaking of bread, they were in prayer together, doing all this. And then, then they received the Holy Spirit. That's where we're going to be pretty much jumping off from. When you receive the Holy Spirit, when you are saved, you then have a desire. Something different changes in you. You have a new creation. Something that sets you apart has happened to Luke, has happened to Paul. Something that makes you desire a relationship with Christ, to, to serve Christ in a way that you didn't have before. So as we begin this conversation, I ask you today, do you know that? Do you know this, this yearning to know the God of heaven and his son, Jesus Christ? Do you have a desire to, to spend time to linger in that relationship with him? Maybe you're saying, preacher, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never felt that. I'm just happy to check the box Sunday morning to get on with the rest of my week. I believe in Jesus, but I've never felt that. Then can I encourage you today to get on your face before God and don't get up until you do experience that relationship with Christ. There must be a newness, a changing, a new creation. Old things all passed away. Do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Have you come to a realization of sin in your own life? Or do you still say, well, I mess up, but we're all human. I'm not as bad as that guy. Do you rationalize your sin or does it break you? Does it cause you to say, how can I do this thing? How can I sin against God in this way? Does it break you in both spirit Emotionally, even physically, does it cause you to cry out to God? And say, heal me, forgive me. Do you have a relationship with Christ? Those of us that, that would answer that question, yes. Let me ask you this. Does that relationship with Christ then cause you, compel you, push you to go and to share Christ with other people? Do you have a great commission in your heart? Do you have a desire to share what you know? about the lover of your life to other people? If you don't, repent. It's that simple. Repent, say, forgive me, Father, for I've lost my first love. You should desire, you must desire to be a great commission Christian to, to express the book of Acts in your everyday life. So we have things to do this morning. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you've never repented of your sin, made Him the Lord of your life, do it this morning. It says, call on the Lord while he is near. Don't put it off. Get around to it this morning. For those of us that know the Lord as Savior, but we, we've been ignoring that neighbor. When we see that person that we know is lost in the grocery store, we, we skirt to the, to the taco line or the other aisle to get around them. Maybe it's a family member. You know they're lost that you've been unwilling to approach that difficult subject. Repent. Ask God to, to, to give you an endowment of the Holy Spirit to, to be able to speak in boldness and in truth. This morning's your chance to do that. This altar's going to be here. I'm going to be standing here. We're going to sing a few verses. It's called the invitation. It's an invitation to come and to commit your life to Christ. Will you do it? Will you commit your life to the lover of your soul, the one who came and died on the cross for you? I pray that you will. Would you pray with me now as we prepare for that time? Fathers, we, um, as we pause right now, asking you to, uh, to work in our lives. Father, asking you to do what only you can 
to come in and, and recreate, to change, to make anew something that was broken. Father, that you would reveal to us our sin. Lord, that we would see our sin as, as what it must be, uh, the darkness, the, the death, the suffering of your Son on the cross. But Father, please don't leave us there. Don't leave us broken. Father, take us from there to the fact that you loved us enough to forgive us that sin. Lord, bring us out of that ditch. Bring us out of the grave. And allow us to, to stand before you, to worship you in holiness and in truth. Father, from a pure heart. Father, heal us and give us a joy. Give us peace. Give us mercy. Those that call on you, both Savior and Lord. And Father, when you do this, as you do this, allow us to live out the book of Acts. Allow us to be your hands, your feet, your missionaries, your, your preachers, your friends, your neighbors, to share that great gospel to those that live around us. Lord, we ask all these things, not so that we can pat ourselves on the back or, or write great letters about who we are, but Father, that we would be humble as Luke, that we would give you all the glory that we would say only you deserve the praise and the honor of anything good that would come from your creation. Father, we ask all these things in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please?